I'm going along or flowing with song, the sin clouds all rolled away. The heavenly dove is bending above to cheer me from day to day. All glory to him I bring, with gladness to him By day and by night, this wonderful song I sing. He's guiding me straight to their heaven's gate and making my pathway clear. He's leading me on to heaven's fair throne with angels to dwell up there. Glory to Him I bring. saving grace when earth life is o'er then forevermore I'll look on his smiling face all glory to him I bring with gladness to him I cling with perfect delight by day and by night this wonderful song Praise the Lord. <coughs> mm. Allergies. Page 242. Where the soul never dies. I think that's the important concept is that the soul never dies and that's what's important that's that's everything that we're working for working toward is the condition of our soul 242 to canaan's land i'm on my way where the soul never dies my darkest night will turn Never dies, no sad farewells, no tear dim dies. Where all is love and the soul never dies. A rose is blooming there for me, where the soul never dies. Shores of home where the soul never dies. No sad farewell, no tear dim eyes. Where all is love and the soul never dies. My life will end in. 
dead that sleep where the soul never dies and everlasting joys I'll reap where the soul never dies no sad farewell no tear dim eyes where all is love and the soul never dies I'm on my way to that fair land where the soul never dies where there will be no parting hand where the soul never dies have no sad farewell no tear dim dies where all is love Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We are in the book of Job. And we're on chapters 36 and 37. Job chapters 36 and 37. We have been, those of you that have been able to follow where we are, this is the last of Elihu's long rant. And uh, he's going to finish it up. Even though God only allowed Satan to do these things to Job, and I mean, God didn't do them himself, but he did indeed allow Satan to do those. And God didn't do these things himself. Both God and Job are judged by Satan's actions. Did you notice that? Job was judged because they said, well, he's in sin because of the wrath of God. That's, I mean, you know, God's, God's correcting Job. Uh, Job's having to pay for his sins, and Satan was very careful to make it look like that. But Satan is the one that did all of this. And God and Job were judged by Satan's actions. So I wonder how often that happens to, to others also, where a person is going through something that's very difficult. And so, I mean, we begin making judgments. Well, I wonder what they did to deserve this. What, what was it? What, what have they been doing wrong that is causing them to have to uh, have to go through this uh, and then we begin judging God also well why would why would God do this to somebody I mean why would God do something like that to Job he didn't Satan did okay uh, God is often judged when things go poorly, when pain has been inflicted, any time circumstances are less than optimal, God is judged for that. Well, if there was a God, why did he allow that to happen? But rarely, if ever, is God judged when things are going well. Right? Isn't that the truth? I mean, people will, whenever things go bad, when they go south, whenever they've got, whenever a tragedy hits, they blame God. But what about all of the times 
when things were going well and there wasn't a care and, and life was so smooth, did they blame God for that? No. Why is it, why is it that we're like that? The devil made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> the devil made me do it. One of the Flip Wilson lines, yeah. In chapters 3 through 37, chapters 1 and 2 were the, the insight chapters that Job or the friends never knew. Okay, that it showed what happened in heaven and what Satan did. Chapters 1 and 2. But beginning in chapter 3, when Job began his first speech, all the way through chapter 37, where Elihu ends his speech, God is mentioned over 100 times. Just, I'm just, and I just looked at the King James Bible, and I just did a search for God in the book of Job. And God, it's, it's like 102 times that God is mentioned over and over again. And, and the three friends say, well, had told Job, God is judging you. If you hadn't sinned against God, then, then you wouldn't be going through this. God is not unjust to do this to somebody without cause. What did you do, Job? God, and over and over, over a hundred times, and do you know, after chapter two, do you know how many times Satan is mentioned? Zero. Not once. And he's the one that did all of it. Every bit of this was done specifically by Satan. I mean, chapters 1 and 2 show us, and there's no, there's no question about it, that it was all Satan doing this. So, I mean, we can see how well that Satan does his works of deception and subversion and keeps himself hidden from all of it. Well, it's just like Drew, <laughs> whenever he was growing up, you know. You would hear a big old rowl in the back room. And just, I mean, but just as that rowl was going, here would come Drew, just like nothing had happened, you know. He, and he, he's the one that instigated all of it. He got it all started and then just slid out, waiting for someone else to take the blame. And he was good at it. And Satan, I'm telling at a bazillion times more, I think it's going to be interesting from eternity's perspective when we, when we see the full story, when we see all that really is happening. Anyone have a comment? This study for me in Job has just been an eye-opener. It's been a real, a real revelation to me. Elihu's perspective of God. Now, we had the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and the other one. <laughs> I didn't write them down. I know those names, but my, they just slipped me. Uh, what was the other one? Eliphaz, Bildad, and which one? Zophar. Zophar, yes. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And all, even Job too, because Job would, would talk with them. But that generation had a view of God that if you were being blessed, then you were right with God. But if something went wrong then you are the one that was at fault for that. You did something wrong, something bad, and so it's all your fault. It's very, it was very similar, in my judgment, to the prosperity gospel teaching, that as long as you are being prosperous and you've got gobs of money coming in, then you're right with God. But then if something 
goes wrong and you begin having financial difficulties, then it's your fault. You have sinned and you've got to make things right and get back into that uh, place of prosperity. And I don't believe that. Bad things happen, as we can see in the book of Job, to very godly, very righteous people. So let's, let's start here in chapter 36. Again, we've, this is, there were six chapters of Elihu's rant. Uh, but Elihu's feelings are that Job, in chapter 36, Elihu's feelings are that Job has a wonderful opportunity here to repent and make things right. I mean, this is what Elihu is going to... Uh, Job, this is a good thing that's happening to you because this is God giving you a chance to repent and make things right. Repent, Job. Verses 1 through 4. I want to read those, and I want, you to, I want you to think about what those are saying. Elihu also proceeded and said, Suffer me a little, and I will show thee what I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar, and will ascribe righteousness to my Maker. For truly my words shall not be false, he that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. Pay attention to me. You guys were, were throwing out all kinds of bad stuff, but now the one who is perfect in knowledge is finally talking to you. I'm telling you, Elihu is full of himself. Do, do you get that? I, I read commentaries. I mean, just read gobs of commentaries. And most of them never talk about Elihu's arrogance. But all through his speech, I mean, the guy lifts himself up. Look at me. I'm going to give you the truth. I am God's man. I'm the one that's going to set everything straight. I'm going to give you the real reasons. I really don't believe that anyone with that attitude is really going to be able to speak for God. I mean, he says, um, I will fetch my knowledge from afar and will ascribe righteousness to my maker. That's all well and good, but then verse 4, For truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge... Perfect in knowledge is with you. Verses 5 through 12. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne, yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. And if they be bound in fetters, and beholden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded. He openeth also their ear to discipline, and commandeth that they return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. And so this sums up all that Elihu has been saying. It just pretty well sums everything up in Elihu's view of God. God blesses and rewards the righteous and punishes those who are disobedient. If a person is doing right, then his life will be one of blessing 
and ease. If a person falls upon hard times, then God is displeased with that person and will discipline that one until he or she repents. Is that a right view of God? No. Why or why not? Most of us probably grew up in an attitude that if everything was going good, then God was blessing you. But if things started to go wrong, then you were to search your heart and find out where the sin was, where you were going wrong. I mean, it was even taught oftentimes you may not even know what the sin is. You're just going to have to get before God and pray through. And I'm not against praying through, okay? I mean, to, to pray until one touches God and knows that there's nothing between them and God. There's nothing wrong with that. But we were taught growing up that if... The, if, if if for some reason things weren't going good, then you needed to search your heart and find out why. And that was Elihu's view. Is that the way God is? Does, I mean, anyone have a comment? What? Isn't that blaming God? I think so. I, Brother Danny asked, isn't that blaming God? Yeah, I think so. Sometimes we'll, and it seems like we go to one extreme or the other and we never really find the middle ground. But God is gracious and kind. God does more forgiving. I mean, the real, the real forgiving, okay? Seventy times seven in one day. Even when we sin on purpose, when we sin deliberately and expect God to forgive us, He does. It's not fair. I mean, for anybody to be able to do that to God is absolutely unfair. And still yet, God, and we don't want God to forgive those kinds of sins, right? Somebody needs to pay. Well, somebody has paid, and that's Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that if a person continues in willful sin that it's not going to affect their spiritual life because I think there is a place to where they take themselves out of fellowship with God and even though God is ready to forgive and willing to forgive and wants them to come back into fellowship more than anything else, that sin affects them in such a way that they lose out with God and backslide. Because all the sincerity is gone. The reality, right, the reality of really serving God is gone. The reason for serving God. I mean, the promise is that we can live in victory. We either go to the extreme of such free grace that we don't have to do anything or... We're constantly searching our heart, trying to find, is God angry with me? Is God mad at me? What did I do this time? Why, why, why don't I feel the presence of the Lord? And both of, both, in my judgment, both extremes, neither extreme reflects who God really is. We walk by faith and not by sight. Whether we feel it or not, we just believe, Lord, I'm doing my best for you. I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to live for you. 
And I'm going to live by faith. But I think sometimes we, maybe we transpose our own personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, we want to hold a grudge, or we want to pout, or we want to, you know, and we, well. Well, that's how God does, too. God created me in his own image, so, you know, that's yeah. the way God is. Yeah. <laughs> I I really do. I think that's exactly right. We transfer our own characteristics to God, especially the stuff that's hard for us to deal with. And then you've heard people say, "Well, that's God made me this way." Well, no, God didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to an extent. Again, we're back to those two extremes. To an extent. Yes, he did. He gave every one of us an individual personality. And what may be a temptation to me, you would look at that and say, that's the stupidest thing in the world. Who? I don't ever have any kind of problem with that. And, but we're all different in that respect. But to justify ourselves for doing wrong by saying this is the way God made me if God didn't want me this way he should have made me different and justify ourselves that way then we're wrong or he could have stopped me any time yeah 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 something I don't understand what you're talking about is blaming God I have never blamed God for anything, and I never heard any of my Baptist family blame God for anything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's, it's just not been there. Uh -huh. The only time I struggle with him is when I wasn't there when John passed away. Uh -huh. he, we was in the same house, but for the first time in my life with John, I never woke up when he left the bed. Mm -hmm. He went from the bed to the bathroom and died in there. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't there with him. And I struggled with that. Right, and right. struggled and struggled. And finally, God told me it was my choice. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that if I had been with him, I would never forget it. Uh -huh. And God knew what he was doing. Yeah. That's it. One intercount of anything like that. I've never blamed him. I don't understand that. I can understand it. But I don't, I mean, even when Hannah died, I don't ever remember getting angry with God or blaming him for that. Um, I was raised up. I mean, to me, that's probably one of the advantages of getting saved when you're six years old. That's just the way you live. You, tr you learn to trust God and trust Him with everything. And I don't, I mean, I've, I've been around people who have struggled with that enough that I, I know that it's a hard thing. I mean, it, it's hard sometimes for people not to blame God. But whenever we live by faith, and somewhere we have to come to the place to where we say, I don't understand this, but God does, and I've got to leave it with Him. But there are a lot of people that blame God for everything. <laughs> I, listen, this is the honest truth. I've, I have talked to a lot of people who claim to be atheists. And most of the time, the first thing out of their mouth is, if there was a God, why did he allow this or allow that? And they implicitly say, yes, there probably is a God and he's the one to blame. 
And I think there's that part in every one of us that feels and senses the spiritual realm, and we can't deny that. Anybody else? Verses 13, 14, and 15. But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. They cry not when he bindeth them. They die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. He delivereth the poor in his affliction, and openeth their ears in oppression. There in uh, verse 12, if a person, I mean, Elihu is saying, yeah, nobody lives perfect, but God deals with us and he tries to bring us back to himself. But then he, he pulls out his big hammer and he starts smashing. He says, but the hypocrite. Now that's a whole different story. That, that hypocrite, this kind of arrogant, deceptive behavior merits only the wrath of God upon them. And the implication is, Job, you're a hypocrite. If it, and Job claimed over and over again in his speeches, I know I'm not perfect, but I know that I haven't done anything to deserve what's happened to me. And Elihu is, is coming against that. He's saying, the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. They cry not when he bindeth them. Elihu's whole thrust, Job, this is your opportunity to repent. Why aren't you doing it? He'll deliver the poor in, the, in his affliction. He'll open up their ears in oppression, but you've got your, your ears closed and you won't listen to God. Verses 16 through 21. Even so would he have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness. You're in a narrow place and God would have removed you out of the narrow place into a place where there was breathing room, where there is no straightness and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. But thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold on thee. Because there is wrath, beware lest he take thee away with his stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Will he esteem thy riches? No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. So Elihu says that Job has an opportunity because of his afflictions to make everything right with God. Job, God's trying to show you that you need to repent. Whenever I've gone through this, I've thought, boy, these are good camp messages. Come and repent, search your heart, and, and you might not have another chance to do that. And then the big story about, about the one that should have come and repented, and then they died in a car wreck the next day, or, or whatever story. And I'm not saying that, that these aren't things that should not have been considered, okay? But God's mercy is so big. How many times does God save us from tragedy over and over and over again? And God keeps his hand on these young people and he protects their lives. And, and he, I mean, this last, I mean, Elihu, Job, this is your last chance. You need to repent. Repent. 
If you have a comment, just speak up. Verses 22 to 23. Behold, God exalteth by his power. Who teacheth like him? Who hath enjoined him his way? Or who can say thou hast wrought iniquity? Remember that thou magnify his work which men behold. Every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Also can any understand the spreadings of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? That noise of his tabernacle is the noise of God's house. The thunder, you know, the, that's what it's talking about. Uh, behold, he spreadeth his light upon it and cover, covereth the bottom of the sea. For by them judgeth he the people. He giveth meat in abundance. With clouds he covereth the light and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh, cometh betwixt. The noise thereof showeth concerning it the cattle also concerning the vapor. So God is great. He's the one that controls all of the weather. Nothing happens apart from God making it happen. And one, Elihu says, one must be careful how one behaves in the sight of a great God like this. Job, this is God. You're going to have to be careful. And Job has never, I mean, even God's testimony of Job to Satan was, he walks uprightly, he is Jews wicked there is none so righteous as job that was god's testimony to satan about job how do we get into the place that we judge people like this i don't know i do it i do it and I, and I don't want to. I'm, I ask the Lord to help me. Lord, help me to ratchet the judgment back. I don't need to judge anybody. I don't, I don't need to decide what God is condemning them for. That's between them and God. Sometimes don't you think that if we're judging somebody else, then we're, we're losing ourselves. You know, I mean, it's... We can't, we can't blame ourselves for anything if we're judging somebody else. And especially if we're doing it out loud to somebody in earshot, you know, it's like, look at them, don't look at me. Yeah. And the other part of that is, I think that we, we do that in our, in our, in, in our mind because it's, it's like, See, I'm not that bad yet, you know. Right, right, yeah. And we want to position ourselves higher than some than whoever we're judging. Yeah, somebody else, you're leaving yourself alone. Yeah. We don't have the oper the the. It is not ours to judge anybody. It's between them and God. I've often wondered in our church here, we preach and we share the message. If we had some shtick, some kind of a program, some kind of a hook that would hook people, you know, and it would, we, if we could make it somehow an us against them, where, where we have our own little clique and uh, uh, we are the special ones and everybody else isn't as special as what we are, 
I'm going to guess that we, our church would begin to grow because people want to attach themselves to something that's a little bit better than everybody else. And that is so opposite the Scripture. We are to be the servant of everybody. We're not to join a clique and try to make ourselves above. We're supposed to be underneath everybody else. And it's hard for people to want to join something like that. Only the Holy Ghost. And it's just the more I think about it and the more I pray, only the Spirit of God can draw someone to himself. And it has to be a spiritual experience, not a program, not a hook, not, not something that we are doing to make people feel like they're a part of a special organization. Anyone have a comment? Let's go to chapter 37. This is where Elihu draws his final conclusions. And it continues chapter 36, okay? He's talking about all of the great things that God does. Uh, there in verse 26 of chapter 36. Uh, Behold, God is great and we know him not. And God's going to come back and he's going to say some very similar things, but in a different way. So chapter 37, verses 1, 2, and 3, At this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the, vo the noise of his voice. That, all of that thunder and, and the noise in the heavens. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. According to Elihu, Job needs to pay attention to God's voice. God's trying to talk to you, El uh, Job, Elihu says. God's trying to talk to you. You need to pay attention. But that's a judgment in itself, right? Verses 4 through 13. After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Don't you love that? God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain, and to the great rain of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into dens, and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. By the breath of God frost is given, and the breath of the waters is straightened. Also by watering he wearieth the thick cloud, he scattereth, the bright, his, he scattereth his bright cloud, and it is turned round by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. He causeth it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Elihu says that a voice like that of God's ought not to be ignored or taken lightly. God can work wonders to punish people. There in verse 13, he causeth it to come. All of these wonderful things, the cold from the north by the breath of his voice, the, the ice comes and uh, by the breath of God frost is given. Uh, he narrows the waters, straightened. Uh, 
And he, all of these things, he causeth it to come, whether for correction, to correct somebody, or for his land, maintenance to maintain his creation, or for mercy to show his people love. And so Elihu says God can work wonders to punish people, to maintain his creation, or to show people his love. He's saying what God's done to you, Job, all of the tragedies that you're going through, you need to listen. I mean, God might not be speaking with an audible voice, but he's speaking through these circumstances, and you need to repent. I don't even know if Job's listening or not. <laughs> Verses 14 through 24. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine? Dost thou know the balancings of the clouds the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge. How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Hast thou with him spread out the sky which is strong and as a molten looking glass? Teach us what we shall say unto him, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Shall it be told him that I speak? If a man speak, surely he will be swallowed up. And now men see not the bright light which is in the clouds, but the wind passeth and cleanseth them. Fair weather cometh out of the north. With God is terrible majesty. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment, and in plenty of justice, he will not afflict. Men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. So Elihu says no one can figure God out. But Elihu says I, there is one thing that I know. Verse 23, I mean this is how he ends it. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. No one can figure out God. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. I can't, do you see the dig there? You're getting justice here, Job. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're getting justice. He will not afflict. Elihu says it is not God's nature to make people feel bad, to hurt people. Men do therefore fear him, but the wisdom of people God has no regard for. That's what he said there. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. In all of these, in all of Elihu's speakings, okay, in all that he says, it's almost every bit of it really, really good stuff until he makes an application. And it's wrong. He's not right in what he says, even though he thinks that he is God's gift to, to preachers and preaching and, and the ministry. He's off. Just that little bit to where he really doesn't understand why Job is going through what he's going through. And it was the same way with the three friends. They almost had it right. What was, what was missing? Why couldn't they get it right? The key to everything. Why couldn't the friends get it right? They didn't know enough. They did not know that this was this incredibly, I mean, Satan's accusation was 
none of your creation will serve you unless you give them all kinds of good stuff. And unless you reward them, nobody will serve you. And God says, God says, no, you're wrong. I have some that will serve me even if they get nothing from me. Zero. God even went, God said, I've got some that will serve me even if I turn you loose on them and let you do whatever you want to. They will never turn their back on me. Which are we? We want to serve God only in the good times. And when things start getting a little tough, we want to cut out of here. Give it up. And God's contest with Satan was, and God was so confident, I don't care what you do to Job. God said, I'm going to, and this is mind-boggling, God said, I'm going to back up back off, and I'm going to let you do your worst to Job. You can't take his life, but you can take him all the way up to the edge. Only God knows the heart. <laughs> He's the only one that knew Job's heart. But it still, to me, it still speaks to Job's integrity that Job was so willing to serve God, and he was going, no matter what, even though his three friends pounded him, Job was still going to serve God. Satan didn't know Job's heart. No. He thought he knew. Yeah. Only God. Only God knew, yeah. Only God knew Job's heart. But what if, I, and this has made me think, Lord, what if everything goes south? What if nothing is good? What if everything turns out so, I mean, Job lost ten children in a matter of minutes. One child about killed me. Can you imagine losing all of your family? And then your wife telling you, curse God and die. Why put up with this? And, and I, I don't have a stone to throw. Listen, I, I read all the commentaries, and boy, I mean, they ride Job's wife high, but I'm... Put yourself in that position. These were the children of her body. And in a moment, they were all gone. And it looked like it was all Job's fault, even to Job's wife. You can read into, the, into those, that wording there. You know, look what you've done to us. I don't know, I don't know what's happened, but God's... God is punishing you, and I'm the one that has to suffer for it. Give it up, Job. Curse God and die. And then Job says, well, you speak like a foolish woman. Can't we receive good and receive evil from God and not question him for it? And that's where we are, isn't it? The world... Go ahead, Brother Danny. Is that a, like a mob mentality? Once all of these blame God. Yeah. Job's wife, all these friends, all blame God. Well, now the friends blamed Job. They said that, I mean, to them it appeared, and Satan was so careful in what he did, he made it look like God was doing the judging, and then he was sneaking around, skulking around. They're blaming God. They are. They're saying that God's the one that did all of this. Right. They're blaming God. Yeah. But the mob mentality, once it starts, yeah. it's a little bitty piece, yeah. then everybody 
And Job struggled with it too. We went through all of Job's responses. And I'm telling you, Job struggled with trying to justify what had happened. And there was no justifying it. How could you justify everything that happened to Job whenever Job did his best to live for God? At first, I mean, well, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, which was wonderful. But then, whenever we got into studying Job's responses, I mean, he's fighting and struggling, trying to keep his head above water and, and trying to rebut all of his friends and what they're saying. And I mean, it, it was hard. Job is fighting a spiritual battle with everything that he's got. And God is sitting back, doing nothing. Job said, I go and go uh, before me and he's not there. Behind me he's not there. To the left, to the right, God's not there. But he knows the way that I take. When he's tried me, I'll come forth as pure gold. I mean, Job was holding on to that piece of faith. He did not understand what God was doing, but he believed in God. And God's back there, and he's not doing anything. He's not stopping Satan. He's not hindering Satan. He's not appearing to, to take up Job's side. Job's having to do all of it by himself. And all the while, this is what gets me, all the while... God knew that he did not have to intervene and Job was never going to give up his faith in God. And that's where I want to be. I don't want to go through what Job went through, but if I have to, I want to trust God. On Elihu's part, it's easy to speak for God on his behalf when God is silent and no probable consequences will result. I mean, it's easy to say, God, God, God thinks this about you. God. But what happens when God does speak? What happens when God sets things straight be here next week because he's going to do it hallelujah anyone have a comment i i have loved this study because it addresses something i mean honestly in the christian world preachers lay people teachers sunday school teachers most of us never address trusting God even whenever God seems to be nowhere around. Trusting God when God is so unfair that it, that, I mean, when you have to go through something that is not your fault, the most brutal of brutal of brutal things, are you still going to say, God, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to trust you. And there's no reason. I'm telling you, there is no excuse, none whatsoever, for us to give up on God. And that's what this story of Job tells us. I'm After this, Satan was forever defeated in this respect. Never, ever could Satan ever say that, that mankind will never be faithful to their creator because Job did it. And Satan never had that accusation again. Any final comment? Praise the Lord.
Lord, let's stand. Let's just worship the Lord together, can we? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I want to serve you and trust you no matter what, oh, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you.